one. And we're here, ladies and gentlemen. We have an amazing guest with us today, President Lebron of Rice University. Um, once again, we're very honored to have President Lebron. We know he's super busy. We know he's done dozens of these probably already and talked about all these issues already. But we wanted to get him on the podcast because as – the Houston Ensemble. It's also very important to us to have people from Houston who are representing Houston to tell us what's going on in the city, especially during these weird times. So thank you once again, President. And if if you'd like to take a second and, and just... Um, talk about maybe background a little yeah. bit, talk about your history at Rice University, and then mm -hmm. we can go from there. Well, well, thanks uh, both of you so much. It's great to be here, Chad. It's great to see you see you again. Yes. Um, you know, I came to Rice, it's hard for me to believe, from New York City just over 16 years ago. At the time, I was dean of Columbia Law School, and I grew up in the Northeast, spent a year in California looking for a judge, a half year as a high school student in Germany, but but pretty much grew up and went to college in the north the northeast. So it was an adventure coming to Houston and Texas at the time. And what was exciting to me, in addition to learning a new city, was coming to really get to know an entire university. Mm -hmm. you know, before that, I knew the law school world pretty well. And what really excited me about Rice was its breadth and its and its excellence. And, and the opportunity to ask all to really be engaged with the city of Houston and frankly more engaged also with the world around the globe. And it's been really exciting to be part of that process. And that was one thing that I really loved for anybody who's listening, who doesn't know I graduated. I just graduated in May from Rice. And that was one thing that I loved about going to school there is the fact that I actually had a personal communication with you and you know the student body is small enough that you can know everybody and it's just such a high class institution and i really had a wonderful time so by the way thank you for making it a great time i guess i haven't technically talked to you besides the email since graduating but definitely a life-changing uh experience and i was about to go pursue my graduate degree at the manhattan school of music but i deferred it one year just because new york was closed and everything that I needed to do in New York regarding going out and playing and going to the jazz clubs, et cetera, uh, it didn't make a lot of sense to me to take out a loan when I have so many connections in Houston. So that's kind of what you're seeing right now. We are, Armin and I are, are in the Houston Ensemble Music Collective, and we're just trying to invest everything that we can. And so now we got very very new developments and so you're you know in charge of all that at rice university and i wanted to have you on because my mom actually sent me an article i think it was by nbc where she saw it and it was rice's unique approach to covid and you know i still have a lot of friends that are going and they're talking to me about it so president lebron can you maybe just start off and tell us what it's been like for you going through this in this new experience? So there, there aren't a lot of fun things about a pandemic. I have to, to tell you that it's a, it's a, you know, a lot of stress, uh, part because of the responsibility for people's welfare. You know, the first thing really for was for us to protect the health and safety of our, our community. That was kind of principle number one was to protect the health and safety of our community. Uh, principle number two was to rely on scientific advice. You know, looking to the CDC and others and saying, what what works? How can we protect our community? What are the dangers? Uh, and I would say uh, principle number three was to pursue our mission of education and research and service to the greatest degree we could, consistent with principles number one and two. And then the fourth principle was to act in accordance with our values which were formulated so they would be easy for me to remember, which are responsibility, integrity, community, 
and excellence, which spells rice if you haven't figured that out yet. Uh, and, you know, for example, uh, you know, we didn't let any workers go uh, because of the situation of COVID. We've lost a lot of revenue, for example, and for substantial periods of time, our operations on campus uh, were significantly shut, shut down. And so then we had to think about the, the fall and our diverse community in many different ways. The, the students who come from very different backgrounds and face different challenges. Uh, people on faculty and staff who might have different health vulnerabilities or just, just different perceptions of the risks that they faced. And so that led us really to adopt a principle of, of choice insofar as we could. So if faculty members wanted to teach in classrooms, they could teach in classrooms. If they wanted to teach remotely, they could teach remotely. And the same thing for the students. And then we also had to keep in mind our international students. And that was one of the most difficult aspects of this. I, indeed, I might say painful aspects of this. And I'm, I'm hoping as we anticipate a change of administration in Washington, we'll see a change in attitude toward foreign students in the United States. Uh, so we, for example, we set up not quite a campus, but we uh, built on a relationship we already had with the university in China to give our students in China who couldn't come to the United States mm. a kind of temporary home in China. So to kind of bring all of that together, you know, the challenge I think is to, to, to make uh, the community feel safe and then to adopt the measures. And so building on all those principles, you know, we knew a number of things. One is testing is important, tracing is important, Isolation and quarantining is important. Uh, physical distancing is important. Wearing masks is extremely important. And so sort of looking at all of those things and when possible, being outdoors is important. And that's, that's an advantage a little bit mm -hmm. in Houston. And so again, on the basis of the scientific information, really looked at all of that and came up with a strategy. That makes a lot of sense and I know from my friends that currently go there they get a mandatory once a week test and what's interesting to note is that other universities do it different ways as well for example cornell university is testing their students mandatory twice a week uh, and fill out daily symptoms and i'm not saying that i think rice should do that i actually think that might might be a little bit excessive and probably very expensive i'm sure you know more about the finances regarding that but a good thing to note, and correct me if I'm wrong or if it's changed since then, but only 1.1% of anybody at Rice has tested positive. Is that accurate? It, yes, it has been accurate. What we've seen, you know, like the country and, and the state of Texas, we've seen some uptick in the last week or so. Mm. And so, you know, we're not in a bubble. In some ways, Cornell is in, you know, in in Ithaca, New York, a little more isolated kind of position. Uh, and you have to remember, we have 1,600 students on living on campus, but then we also have students from the off campus, we have staff, we have faculty. Um, and, and so you can't completely isolate yourself from the surrounding community. And so we, that, that's the importance really of the of the testing and the contact tracing and the quarantine. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll, we'll have to kind of see how that goes, the explosion of cases across the country. You know, I don't know who thought we would now be almost starting to average over the last few days, something like 120,000 cases per day, new cases across the country. Uh, last I checked, I think it's Texas had surged back to 10,000 cases uh, per day. These are, these are matters of pretty substantial concern moving forward. Yeah. No, and you know, it was so sad. I saw your email just the other day regarding Margarita, the worker. And I actually had a very special relationship with her because she worked at the Shepherd School of Music. Mm -hmm. And I talked to her almost every day when I was there. So that was very sad for me to read. But, um, you know, I think it's good to see everybody's practicing safety uh, regarding the government and the CDC and all this kind of stuff, have they gone out of their way to lighten the burden on you or Rice University regarding finances? Uh, no. Uh, 
there, there have been, you know, the CARES Act, I think, helped with our students. Uh, we're expecting, and we hope, some FEMA support for some aspects. I'm not 100% certain. We're hoping in areas of testing, for example. Uh, but this year, we'll spend something in the neighborhood of $15 million in the testing that we adopted. And that's, you know, that's just one slice of the expenses. Mm -hmm. And then there are also lost revenues. And so almost every university finds itself in some version of this. That is, what what expenses have you uh, incurred? What revenues have you have you lost? And I think we just have to put that aside a little bit. You sort of have to make a decision. Are you going to are you going to stay closed? Or are you going to be open? And if you're going to be open, how do you protect everybody's safety? And those are that is what you have to do. The expenses are what the expenses. But if you're going to decide to open. That's what you have to do. And so we made our decisions about how often we needed to test, for example, and you know, I and everybody else goes into test and you know regularly and they're, they're, we got two different kinds of providers on on campus. One drills your nose a little bit further up than the other drills your drills your nose up. Mm. Um, and and that's worked pretty well for us. Now, the PCR test, that's what's being used at Rice, correct? Yes, that's what we're using. This Do you have any feelings about the accuracy of it? Yeah, the the version we use um, is the most accurate we we know of. None of these tests are are perfect, but you know, based on our experience, it's pretty pretty accurate. We had a situation about a, a week or so ago where there was a problem in the testing. And we had a whole bunch of false positives reported, and then we did, and they reran oh, yeah. the tests, and those turned out. But by the time we didn't wait till they reran the test, all the people were notified, all the contacts were starting to be put into quarantine, mm -hmm. and, and that's kind of how we have to act. So none of this is a hundred percent reliable, and none of the preventive methods are a hundred percent reliable. Right. You know, what, what our hope is, so if you look at the three principal things we're asking people to do, right, is one, one wear masks, and unlike some others, we require masks on our campus all the time, indoors or outdoors. Mm. Good reasons for that, I think. Uh, two is the physical distancing, and three is to do as much outdoors. For example, in the students, uh, the commons have been closed. You can pick up your food in the commons, but you have to eat outdoors or, or in your room. We've been fortunate generally in Houston with the weather. Weather's great here for everybody listening. Yeah. Uh, but it's also been true that we've had especially good weather, I think, this fall. And that has helped us a bit. That's good. And speaking of good weather, I just wanted to let you know the Houston Ensemble was out all day this morning uh, delivering food to the homeless just on the streets. And we were blessed. We were just, uh, you know, praising it earlier. <laughs> sounds kind of churchy of me but we were just uh so happy with the sunlight and you know we're lucky to be in texas there's no doubt about that and i feel well, bad for the states where it's getting very cold because that could that could be different yeah i think one is can you spend time outside where it's much safer according to everything we know but two you're familiar with the rice campus this is not an easy time to be a student i think we have to recognize that the stress the mental health but when you can spend that time outside, walking around a gorgeous campus, you know, my wife and I go on the campus almost every day, walking around, that can also help uplift your spirit. So it's both safer and more uplifting, I think, when you, you have a beautiful campus to, to walk around. I'm also a great enthusiast of Hermit Park, which is mm -hmm. just across the street from the campus. And I pray that you did not feel accosted the other night when I said hello to you. <laughs> no, I love it when people say, you know, hello to me, you know, before the pandemic, um, you know, whenever I was out shopping or the grocery store, on the one hand, I recognize I have to behave everywhere I go. On the other hand, I love it when alumni or others come up and introduce themselves on airplanes, mm. uh, the most extraordinary places all around the world. So it doesn't matter to me whether it's on a street, whether it's on the campus or an airport in Tokyo, uh, I love it when I run into Rice alumni, and particularly people like yourself who I've gotten to know when they were students. Yeah. If I might, just for real quick, jump forward, 
because I'm thinking about the repercussions in the future. Let's say that numbers go down. Let's say that we're willing to say, okay, no more lockdowns. Let's say things begin to look normal again. Do you think that there's going to be some leakage, some like some residual effects that this might have on the university? Let's say like, are we going to just stop with all masks, stop all testing, just like this clean and ready? Or is it going to be a transition out of there? And maybe do, do we continue to test in the future regardless of what? Mm -hmm. What do you think? You know, uh, I thought you were about to ask a slightly different question, which I'll come back back to. Okay. But I think on the testing and the mass, it depends what the health authorities are telling us, right? Okay. If they're telling us, you know, the risk of transmission is now, you know, nearly nil, or we might, for example, decide maybe at that point we don't need to wear masks outside, but we're going to keep them inside. We're going to keep special ventilating systems operating. Mm. There, are, there are a bunch of things we might do according to what changes. You know, when does a vaccine, what is, what do the medical treatments look like? And we have to remember that there's sort of going to be two things going on. There's going to be better medical treatments mm -hmm. and hopefully the vaccine. And we don't know exactly what the timing of that is. We already know the medical treatments gotten a little better in the sense that people understand now more mm -hmm. what works and what, what doesn't work. Right. So that we're going to be, uh, take guidance again from the authorities and, uh, I went to law school, not medical school, so, so I'm not going to make the guess there. The you know, question I thought you might ask is, mm -hmm. you know, when we say no more masks and, you know, no more social, physical distancing mm -hmm. needed, does everything that happened during COVID kind of go away? Mm -hmm. Or are there things that endure? And as I, I kind of like to say, you know, 99 point something percent of things about a pandemic are bad. But on the other hand, we're learning things and we're developing new capabilities. One of the moments in this that struck me the most was, was in a meeting that also had some students and administrators. And one of the students asked a question, which was something like, well, when all this is over, we'll still be able to get some of these services by Zoom, right? <laughs> and I think that was an indication that there's some services under some circumstances that people want to have by Zoom. Uh -huh. That many students want to have the case, the flexibility about how to take a class or how to attend class. And I don't think universities have fully recognized the mobility that our society, and particularly, if I can say, your generation and your generation of students has, right? You're never more than three feet from your from your cell phone. You know, you have other kinds of devices that that we might carry around. You can access online classes from anywhere in the world if they have the basic connection what are the possibilities that this opens for students in thinking about their education now you know if you're if you're a music student in the performance area maybe that's a little more restricting mm, uh, one thing i learned for example sitting in on a music session last spring was zoom doesn't work quite efficiently enough for mm -hmm. music instruction mm -hmm. on there but but they got around that they use box to deposit a file mm -hmm. and then that enabled them to have a higher level of of inner interaction and, and critique mm -hmm. and so i just think we're going to create new possibilities for people and this this line we now have between this education is in person and this education is online i think we're going to see more people saying you know, I, I want some of both of those in my education. Mm -hmm. And here's why I want that. And here's, here's how I'm going to use that freedom and flexibility. Yeah. I, ha I have certain concerns just personally thinking about, like, it was interesting that you mentioned the music thing. You know, um, you know, personally, I'm a believer that um, you pretty much need to be physically involved if you're learning music, you know, it... And it, it, when the physical thing is missing there, I don't think the learning is happening as well, to be honest. And um, so I guess I was just thinking, like, do you what, what do you think? Will there be less people physically going to universities after this? Mm. 
That's a great question. You know, there, there's somewhere generally it's estimated between 4,000 and 5,000 institutions of higher education in the United States. That includes a pretty wide variety of community colleges, some specialized institutions, mm-hmm. public, not-for-profit, and, and, and private. So you're talking about incredible diversity of institutions. And each of them is kind of facing a certain kind of adversity uh, under the pandemic, which isn't the same for all of them. And as we go forward, I think we are going to see some changes. You're going to see more universities offering online degrees, and those online degrees are going to compete with on-campus degrees. Mm -hmm. You're going to see a range of price points for folks. I think you're exactly right that it's not the same two things. It's not the same in every field, Mm -hmm. and it's not the same for every person. And so that's going to create this incredible kind of variation where some things and you know if, if if it's a musical instrument you're instructing and and you're instructing somebody who you're hoping will play at the very highest level right so that's not the same as you know your average 10 year old wants to learn a musical instrument right right those are those are different technologies that you need or or you may act you may really need to be in person Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. because of the of, of the the things the instructor needs to be able to hear at the moment mm-hmm. and be able to interact to get that you know increment which which leads one to being truly virtuoso yep. so i i think that's what we're going to see but we're all going to see more creativity you know one of our professors i think maybe in chemistry or related field mailed out lab kits to the entire class but wow. we mail out a lab kit again that creates a little more flexibility. But back to your question um, more precisely, what we've seen and a lot of colleges and universities have seen, the demand, the desire to be together, to be on a campus, the need in particular for low-income students, first-generation students to be in that environment on campus, to have the support of their fellow students, to have the physical environment that's supportive, to have the technology that's supportive. Uh, I don't think for universities like Rice, we're not gonna see a less in demand to be on campus. I think it's, what we're seeing is kind of the opposite. Mm -hmm. Now we've had a number of students who at the beginning of the semester said they didn't feel safe coming back. They stayed at home. They saw what was happening at Rice. And then they made a decision in the middle of the semester. They said, can we come back to campus? Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, we're going to see that. But I think you're not going to necessarily see that at every kind of university. Mm -hmm. And I I think that that's that's a really interesting point that you just talked about regarding students being afraid in the beginning, not wanting to come, and then midway through saying, oh, I want to come back. And I'm, I'm feeling that in our society as a whole right now because... I have a little side job and I work at a coffee shop and you can feel people becoming more and more comfortable. And as we learn more and more about the virus, I feel like it's changing and I feel like the whole perception is changing. For example, from the ages for people, the ages of 18 to anywhere from 55 to 60, I think the survival rate is 99.8% or 9%, 8 or 9% which is good. It's not portrayed to us that way. And, you know, that's creating a lot of fear among people. Of course, we need to make arrangements to protect those who are at risk, like elderly people or, you know, people with diabetes. It seems like people with diabetes get it really badly for some reason. There are a lot of sources. People are immunocompromised. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're right below a certain age. You know, particularly folks your age, uh, the fatality rates are very, very low. Uh, we ought to be cognizant of some of the longer term implications that folks have started to get concerned about. Mm-hmm. But look, if, if, you, if you said, we now know this is going to last two years, right? If we knew that, I don't, I don't want you to listen to me. I, I don't think it's going to last two years. Nobody thinks it's going to last two years. I'm just using this to illustrate a point. But if you said it's going to last two years, then then you might say, we have to approach this in a different way, mm-hmm. right? We can't keep people locked down in the same kind of way. I think what we do have to accept is the pandemic is real. The infections we're measuring are 
are real. An overall death rate that looks in the United States to be maybe a little bit sh shy of 2% is continuing. The, the idea that this death rate is just now way, way different, it's, it's not. It depends really what the percentage is, mix of the population mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and so we have to figure out how to design it. So because what we don't want is folks to have this COVID fatigue mm. and then put us in the situation that we're in now where the risk is that we will overwhelm the hospital system, overwhelm the intensive care units, and therefore experience a death rate that's considerably higher than um, you know, the ones we've talked about. And, and you can see from places where that's happened, that's exactly what happened, has, has happened. So, so we have to, I think, continue to protect our society, um, continue to do everything we can to, to prevent the spread and simultaneously support and find out the things that people can safely do. Right. Uh, and that's a little bit what, you know, we have to explore on our campus and we have to explore as a society. And so you can pretty safely go out and eat in a restaurant on a patio, right? I kind of know that's a pretty safe thing to do. Uh, if you go out and hang out, you know, in a typical bar for a couple hours, that is not a safe thing to do. Right. And you know, I've got a few things on my docket here. It's really interesting because Armin and I, our line of work, musicians within the city, is all about playing at venues like bars, some indoor, some outdoor. Uh, every Friday and Saturday night, I've been playing in a very small indoor bar. And early on, I was very worried about it. But I've been fine to this day, and I don't know anybody in my peer group who's gotten sick, thankfully. But the other thing that we're seeing so much is the how politicized the virus is becoming. And especially, I think it's amplified because of the election. And obviously that got taken care of yesterday. Um, we had a doctor named Dr. Joseph Verone. He was featured on CNN, BBC, Houston Chronicle, and a bunch of other news sources. We had him on because he was talking about his use of hydroxychloroquine. And he seemed very nonchalant about it. So I emailed him and I said, will you just come speak with us and talk to us about treating COVID? And when he was on the show, we talked about hydroxychloroquine and how politicized it was. But I really respected his response because he said, you know, it worked if you used it early on and it's been used for a long time, but I've changed. I have a completely new protocol. It's basically just a mixture of vitamins and steroids that we use now. And he said, I don't know why it needs to be so politicized. And I feel like we're just seeing too much of that going on right now. And a lot of unnecessary tribalism regarding the virus. And, you know, then another thing, and I really want to ask you about this because this is definitely coming down the pipeline. A vaccine is going to come out and they're you know they're trying to get it out fast and no decent vaccine has come out before five years it has taken at least five years for all decent vaccines so if a vaccine came out uh you know in the next six months what's your response to that well i don't think Look, sci science and medicine um, get better. There have been a huge amount of resources, both in the private and the public sector, put into this. I, I, I don't think the way to start thinking about it is, you know, well, if it, if it comes out, you know, in less than a year and a half, then we ought to presume it's it's unsafe and not reliable. I, I would not completely that, agree with that. I that agree approach. with that sentiment. I, I do want to say I, I don't. I don't quite share the assessment on hydroxychloroquine, but I'm again, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a scientist. I will, I will leave that to others. I think what's important and that unfortunately we have seen undermined is having independent agencies that have protocols and make judgments. Mm -hmm. And seeing the subversion of these, 
whether it's the CDC or the FDA or others, is very problematic because it leaves us without anything, right? That's the whole point of an independent agency and giving it the resources and giving it the scientific community and the trust. And so when they come out and say, we think this vaccine is safe, it has passed our protocols and folks ought to, ought to take it. You know, sometimes um, you, you have situations where you develop things and you, you give people a choice about whether to take them or, or not. Uh, that's particularly for people who might be suffering from fatal diseases and their experimental treatments. But I, I think we need to see a return to the trust we put in the scientific agencies in the United States. These agencies over time have garnered immense trust and respectability. Uh, they have not been politicized. They've not been shown, I don't think, by and large to be, you know, ridiculously overprotective or, or cautious. And th this is an environment where we may not, we may not wait to the perfect vac vaccine. We need to know that it's safe. Mm -hmm. And we ought to know that it's substantially effective. But substantially effective is not going to mean 100% effective. And I, from what I've listened, heard from the authorities, this is likely to come, the first vaccine we have is not going to be the same as the third vaccine we have or the fourth vaccine that we have. Uh, but because of this massive danger we're facing around the globe, you know, I, I'm, I'm optimistic that this is going to set a new record in terms of when we get to a very safe and reliable vaccine. And then hopefully it will also be one that we can we have the ability to mass produce quickly and to distribute safely. So not one of the vaccines that needs to be transported, frozen or things like that. Right. That will make it much harder and more expensive to distribute. And if there was a vaccine that came out next six months that had all that criteria, would you go ahead and mandate that for the current student body? I think we'd have to look at all the, all the, all the facts. Um, I think there's a good chance that we might mandate it for the student body. Uh, our responsibility is to protect the student body as a whole. Our, 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 our university is built on, on, on science. But I think it's hard to really quite make a judgment uh, about that. We would want to know things like, well, uh, you know, suppose suppose 90% of the students got it, would the campus be pretty much safe? I don't, I don't know the answer to that question. Yeah. I have to look into that. And so I, I can't say for certainly what exact rule that we would adopt under those circumstances. But if necessary, I think we would mandate it and, for everybody who could safely take it. And I know back in July, we got the email regarding the mandatory flu vaccine. And was that was that an attempt to just kind of overall mitigate sickness for this coming semester or was the flu the mandated flu vaccine meant to potentially mitigate covid as well well getting the flu vaccine to my knowledge doesn't mitigate covid but you could have that i agree the, the combination of the diseases, I think, that would make them more, more deadly. Or, um, and I think we just wanted to protect our entire campus as much as possible, and also protect the resources of the medical resources uh, mm -hmm. around. And you know, again, folks had a choice of whether or not to be on our campus. Mm -hmm. And so I think the idea is, you know, fine. Yes. If you want to be on our campus, we have to adopt the measures that both protect you and protect the community. Mm -hmm. And it's it's kind of we've got our hands pretty full dealing with with the COVID situation. We don't need added layered onto that the, the flu, of um, course, a, a, a flu epidemic on the on the campus. And again, this was the advice generally that was coming out of the health authorities. Mm -hmm. I don't want to ask a yes or no question so i'm going to try to make it a little better than that but i was just thinking i'm a lawyer i can take any yes or no question <laughs> yeah. and turn it into a multitude of yeah, I, that's awesome okay well <laughs> you know because you said there will probably be a variety of ways in the future where we can uh, a, a variety of consequences to the pandemic and our response going 
in the future for universities. Um, wh what do you think about the option to, let's say, let's say, hypothetically, you have a body of students that don't want to take a vaccine? It, it's possible, perhaps, perhaps. Mm -hmm. What, how do you feel about the option for those students? Because it would, it would be really unfortunate if Rice would then ha have to let go of that student, right? Let's say if, if that student refuses to take a vaccine, it would be really unfortunate to have to let them go. Is it possible that they simply do all of their classes, all of their work at home? They get their diplomas mailed to them. They get paperwork mailed to them. No going to school. Well, that, you know, uh, obviously, uh, we're, we're not going to police the behaviors of our students that don't have consequences for other students or, or their welfare when they are physically our responsibility, right? Mm -hmm. So, I, so I, I don't think we would see that as posing an issue for us. We didn't say that remote students had to get a flu. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, yeah. I, don't, yeah. I don't think so. No. And, and so people make lots of different choices uh, and we decide what extent we police those choices. And, and we see that through our society also, mm -hmm. right? In the United States, there's a right to homeschooling for, for folks who for every reason, they don't, they don't want to send their kids to the public, mm -hmm. public schools. So I think it is one of the things that, that makes our country great is this respect for people's choices. But when you put yourself into communities, mm -hmm say, I'm going to be part of those communities, then we have a collective responsibility to keep these communities safe and to do what we can to keep them safe. And I, and I think that's the situation we face now with the pandemic and the interaction between the flu and the pandemic. But that's not to say that we shouldn't, you know, do what we can to respond flexibly. And we do that in many different contexts, much more than we used to do, for example. Uh, the Italian story might I, you know, I, I learn a lot from Twitter. It's not all good, but but I learn a lot. And uh, my my niece is is disabled, and I follow her uh, on Twitter, and I learn a little bit about the disability community. And to see t today the reaction that folks had uh, to uh, Biden's speech, just mentioning the word you know disability in his speech. That's become an important part and obligation of what we do to make our education accessible to people. Mm -hmm. So, so an underlying philosophy consistent with community safety is we do want to be accessible to everybody we can be accessible to. And you know, every year we make investments into accessibility on our campus. Mm -hmm. It's a vital part of, of what we do. And we learn more, for example, about the challenges that say, uh, low income and first generation students. And we invest in figuring out. So it's not just if you are privileged enough to have the right kind of experience that you can get into Rice, but how do we assess your talent? And then how do we support you at, at, at Rice? Mm -hmm. uh, so those have to be the kinds of questions we, we ask to make sure that the education we provide is as accessible as possible to the widest range of extraordinary students that we're able to attract. Now, I want to go off of that slight diversion, but analogous. And your background just reminded me of it. And this is perfect because I've been so curious about your opinion. And I don't know if you sent an email about it. If you did, I did not see it. This is regarding the Willie statue in the quad right behind your head, I believe. People, there are a lot of students at Rice that want to take it down because in the late 1800s William Marsh Rice uh, in his estate owned 18 slaves can you give us a quick opinion on that I know this is very delicate territory for you and if it's too delicate that's okay I know there's a lot of it's very hard to be in your position but if you do have an opinion I would love to hear it well I, I think as I've said in, in letters to the to the campus um, you know, we have a task force that's looking broadly at a wide range of issues and what they call, we call the built campus. And 
is one of those issues and the task force is, is thinking about them. And this is a, a issue on which opinions differ broadly. And we're gonna wait till the work of the task force is com completed, at least on issues that concern the build campus and take that under advisement as we make a decision about it. Sure, I think that kind of, I'm not familiar exactly with the Joe Biden speech that you're talking about regarding disability, but it seems that we're seeing a lot of this sentiment today. And Armin and I know 100% agree that we need to be aware of everybody's feelings. We need to be aware of the history and we're sympathetic. But at some point, I think a lot of us, for example, I biked past slash walked past that statue every single day of my rice career and I never knew that fact about him and it never had an impact on me and I'm 99% sure because I would never say anything with 100% certainty that the majority of other students also did not know that and sometimes I worry that we get on a tribal bus and we just start everybody's just toting their flag and I and I always worry about tribalism yeah. but well but they, look there are a few different issues here and uh, I'm not going to comment specifically on our statute but, but we as a university have an obligation to educate people and they ought to be aware of things mm -hmm. and so so there, there, there are different kinds of claims that are made and one of the claims is that people should be aware of the history of, of rice including aspects mm -hmm. of the history of William Marsh Rice, and I, I don't actually think there's an argument against that. And if you if you look at the way people have dealt with things around the country, uh, there are different ways. You can remove names, you can remove statues, uh, or you can add information, and, yes. and you can add other kinds of of monuments and symbolism. And again, I'm not I'm not commenting today on the the uh, situation at Rice, but I I, th I think we need to be you know thoughtful in our approaches we need to listen to each other mm -hmm. i've always thought that one of the most important things about education was learning to see the world through the eyes of others mm. and and you know i'd like to see the world through the eyes of musicians you know i learned to play the trumpet when i was younger but but i don't think i see the world as a as a musician and how that affects how you think about it mm -hmm. uh and you know, my own family is, is biracial, and that gives me a little bit of a chance to maybe see the world through the eyes of, of, of others. And, and to me, it's both rewarding, but it also leads to me, to, I think, and others to be able to treat other folks with greater respect and dignity when we, we know how they perceive things. Mm. Mm -hmm. And I, I think what we have as fellow citizens is an affirmative obligation to understand the way that other people look at the world and, and think about the world. And, and that's part of the conversation I think we as a nation must have. And it's a conversation in which we must undertake that, I think, with respect and civility to understand what the issues are. And we're not always going to agree but I think we can come out of this understanding what the different perspectives are and how, what are the, what's the common ground that we can find to address those uh, differences and to understand you know, your perspective on things, some of the folks on campus. And so the only thing I, I the only thing, you know, it's, it's a hard thing, the only thing I'm really intolerant of in a sense is intolerance. Mm -hmm. and, so we, we, we got to create that, that dialogue. Now, there are limits to that, I think, as American society and what we, what we value. Uh, so, so I think we need to do both of these things. We, we need to understand all the different kinds of peoples who make up our society and the perspectives they bring. And we need to come together as a nation with a sense of what it means to perhaps be an American and what our aspirations as a country are while in my view not forgetting that we are simultaneously uh inhabitants, inhabitants of an increasingly interconnected world and and globe and that also must be part of our our thinking and you know as musicians you know you i assume you play music that has come from 
all around the globe and different points in, in history. And we all benefit from, from doing that and, and even listen to music produced by people that in retrospect we find pretty objectionable. Yeah, you know, that, I thought that that was a very beautiful way of putting all that. I really agree with everything that you just said. So, and that's very true. You know, the music that we play is inherently black music and we want to make sure because it's jazz for anybody who doesn't know it's primarily jazz or jazz inspired music and we respect that well i tell you uh, a very brief story you know i we played a football game in uh it was in memphis tennessee a number of years ago and um that's where graceland is right in memphis tennessee I think so. so. I'm not 100% sure, but I think so. I'm pretty sure. And my wife said she wanted to go visit Graceland, you know, Elvis Presley's uh, home. And I said, I don't want to go to Graceland. I'm not interested in tourist attractions. And my wife said, no, we're going to Graceland. And so we went to Graceland. And long story short, I'm the person who wants to look at everything as we move along through the museum. And, and, and what... Uh, we, one of the things that really moved me visiting to Graceland was to see all the different influences mm. that came together in, in Elvis Presley's music and the influence of, of black music, for example, and Christian music that, that came and rock and roll, all, all of which came to, together really to create this remarkable artist. And, and to me, that's uh, one of the joys of living in this environment and, and learning and seeing how people bring things together to create new things sometimes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. By the way, uh, President LeBron, how are you doing on time? We don't I want to... About five minutes. Five minutes? Of, okay. Five minutes. Well, if I may, Please. we we talked about a lot of, lot of serious topics and um. But let's go real quick. What has been the best part in your experience at Rice so far mm-hmm. this year? What has been something that you're really proud of that you've accomplished? Those are slightly different questions. Yeah, that's right? true. That's true. That's true. What <laughs> you can choose one. Part, and I feel like I've gotten to know in some ways more students. It's a little odd during the pandemic, but I've gotten to really – get to talk to in part the zoom actually creates in some ways more possibilities to you know schedule meetings you know to get from meetings to the other right. and i've gotten to know more of our our students this year and just gotten to see how interesting and extraordinary they are um it, 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 it's really been i've written more recommendations for students probably this year than mm. than than most years and when i write a recommendation for somebody I, you know, that's another stage of learning more about them, maybe getting to see an, a, an essay that they've written for, mm-hmm. for a grad school or something like that. So, so that's been really incredible. The other thing is working with just a great team that's had to work together more cohesively than other than ever. And, and, and you know, I hired a lot of these people. I think they're extraordinary, but the creativity is, you know, we got a lot of press about the outdoor tents and mm-hmm. you know five of the tents are sort of outdoor tents four are kind of super tents and and you know they have air conditioning and technology and and everything else um but to work with such a dedicated group and these folks have been working kind of non-stop and you know and you know i it, rice is just one example but you know in lots of areas the stress that people have been working under you know, our medical professor, uh, professionals, right? Um, a lot of our first responders and others, this constancy of demand on them as we deal not just with the pandemic, but this sort of crisis in racial justice, a financial crisis, people unemployed, people losing their homes, so much going on simultaneously, more than at any time in my lifetime. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and just to see people respond to that is incredibly rewarding and then last i'll say just finding you know the opportunities the opening up of our thinking about things right 
like how should we think about rice's role in uh online education right now we've had that conversation some for some time but it's now accelerated and urgent and we're seeing new possibilities around it and so it's it's exciting to be part of the university in a period like that i think the hard part is all the things we can't do that folks have wanted and the folks that complain that you know we haven't played enough of our football games and things like like that and you know we're just trying to make the best decisions for health and safety uh we can and while still accommodating the desires of our faculty students and staff yeah a lot of respect to that and i think that's probably a great place to end it we are so grateful for you coming on here yes, giving sir. us this time uh, it means the world to me that we've been able to facilitate facilitate our communication and a relationship so thank you for helping us because as you probably know this is a grassroots operation that we're really trying to spread information community love all these music <laughs> especially music but um everybody who's listening this was president david lebron mm-hmm. of rice university one of the greatest universities on this side of heaven on this planet <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. anyway all right well president lebron again thank you so much it was a pleasure to have you i'll uh i'll send you a little email post podcast great and we hope well, you thanks, have a- thanks for inviting me and congratulations to to both of you for for setting out in this direction and by the way i love all the little as i would call them chachkas you have on your your the chachka, vest there it looked like you had a ganesh there and, do. and a buddha, buddha and head and they've been i got collected. all those in my house too so good <laughs> sweet well we'll definitely be uh talking to you soon and we wish you the best of of everything for yep. the rest of the semester and the rest of the year great have take a great care. day take uh, care bye president lebron bye 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 and there you go, ladies and gentlemen. That was some Houston Ensemble action for you guys. What a wonderful guest. A lot of information, um, a productive discussion, a civil discussion, and I mm-hmm. wholeheartedly agree about having the conversations. I think that was one of the main points is, is being open and understanding each other and having co- these conversations even when they're hard. And so that's what Houston Ensemble is all about. Follow Houston Ensemble, all socials at Houston Ensemble. Follow us to see where we're playing weekly all around Houston. And check back with us about podcasts and other wonderful things like homeless outreach that we've been doing. And I've got one more thing. If you're loving what we're doing or you want to contribute to the podcast, to the music, to the homeless outreach please go on our website, www.houstonensemble.com. We have a donation button there. So anything you guys give is greatly appreciated. Just know that it's being used to grow the city of Houston. Yep. Thank you so much. And with that, we're out. Three, two, one.